everybody. If anyone comes up with any more questions, just raise your hand and one of our young ladies will come and collect your question. So just to quickly introduce our panel, I'm Irene Milotti, one of the neurologists here, Dr. Michael Okin that you heard speak earlier, Dr. Chris Hess and Dr. Nick McFarland, we're all movement disorder neurologists and we're lucky to have Matt Beakey, who's our dietitian. Some of you might have heard him speak next door. So we'll kind of uh, just start and go through as many as we can. Uh, we'll go down the line and maybe go back and forth a bit. So one of these questions was, um, what medications cause increased constipation? So just to take a step back about what causes constipation. So with age, sometimes there's a higher risk of constipation to begin with with decreased activity level and especially decreased water and fiber intake. So by far the most important things are to increase your water intake because even if you take fiber supplements, if you don't have water, they can't pull water into the gut to make things move. That's how they're supposed to work. But there are actually medications that can increase constipation, which is already very common in Parkinson's. Parkinson's can cause slowing down of the gut movements, causing bloating, uh, irregular absorption of medications and constipation. There's a class of medicines called anticholinergic. Some of them are a medicine called Artane, which is, can actually be used to treat Parkinson's. It has a generic name, trihexyphenidyl. It's used for dystonia and Parkinson's. It can significantly worsen constipation. Even a medicine, amantadine, that we use in Parkinson's can sometimes aggravate constipation. Um, and some of the bladder medications also can, pe medicines people take for bladder symptoms can worsen constipation. So those are kind of the top three um, culprits. Thanks everybody again for coming. Uh, a lot of great questions here. I just want to point out in the back of the room is Janet Romrell who knows everything there is to know about Parkinson's disease. Raise your hand, Janet. Raise your hand. Up high. Everybody look. <laughs> Janet Romrell is the, the, the founding um, first person in the in the center when we started in 2002, even predated Dr. Foote and I. So she has all the answers. We have Lisa Warren and her whole team from rehab. You heard the speech group is here. We have Arlene Diali, Jaina, and others from social work. So there's people around here that can help you with any, any question. We've got a research coordinator. So uh, make sure you take advantage of this great team. Uh, a couple of questions here, and then I'll pass the mic. One is um, about um, updates on over-the-counter medications. And so here um, they clip, you know, there are all the medications that we know to stay away from. And there's this list from the Parkinson Foundation and the Aware and Care Kid and the Parkinson Foundation people are here today as well. Make sure you're familiar with those. And then recently we wrote a blog on, um, uh, for the Parkinson Foundation that's up on their website about over-the-counter medications because most of the pharmacists will tell you no, no, don't take anything with your Parkinson's disease. It turns out um, that's probably just advice that um, is uh, maybe a little bit over-restrictive, and you can probably get away with most of the over-the-counter medications. Watch out, however, for Benadryl and some of the sleep aids with Benadryl-like medications that block um, the cholinergic receptors in the brain, so watch out looking at, at any of the, the sleeping aids and things to see do they have Benadryl or, yeah, diphenhydramine is the, is the other name for, for Benadryl. And so watch for that. And then in some of the medications, some of the cough syrups, there's, there's can be some interaction with drugs like risagiline and selegiline and other things. And then finally, there are um, drugs that people take for colds and runny nose that affect the blood vessels and, and, and really help them to clamp down. And if you have high blood pressure, some of those drugs can be um, not the best to take, can be unsafe. But for the most part, of a lot of the things that pharmacists tell you that you can't take when you're sick, they just say, sorry, you're out of luck. You probably actually can take. And just make sure you're communicating with your doctor if you're not sure or your healthcare team if you're if you're not sure. Um, another uh, quick one is, has, D, has um, DBS been used for patients having chronic pain? The answer is um, yes, it has been. It, it's mostly an experimental therapy. It doesn't have FDA approval, but there's quite a bit of research going on in neuromodulation for pain. 
And actually, though we don't often measure it, people that get DBS for Parkinson's disease, oftentimes they have a shoulder pain or a back pain or something that they has been bothering them and then they go on dopamine and the pain goes away or it gets better or they have DBS and it gets better. And so uh, we don't completely understand that, uh, but, but we definitely see it. So it's still in its infancy. Dr. Hess? So, a couple questions here. Uh, what neuropsychiatry resources will be available at the New Movement Disorder Center? So, for those of you who have, who have not had interactions with psychiatry, Dr. Herb Ward is one of the psychiatrists uh, in the psychiatry department here at, at UF, and he is uh, available to see specifically patients with Parkinson's disease, which he has an extensive experience with, in addition to other types of movement disorders. Uh, I believe there's every plan for Dr. Ward to continue at the new center, and we're, they're also actively looking for uh, and hiring uh, other psychiatrists with interests in movement disorders, so we may see an increase in the number of patients that, um, or the number of specialists that we are able to refer you to. Uh, uh, neuropsychology is a little different, so uh, when you see a neuropsychologist, uh, we're often sending you for more quantitative data, so when we see you in the office, we may do a screening test of your cognition. Uh, we'll ask you, are you oriented to the place, date, the time, identifying animals, counting different tasks, if, and that helps us as a screening test to see if, if further testing is needed. So we will continue to have neuropsychology available at the new center that can, can provide that more detailed screening. Another quick question, do all PD patients go through all the stages? So some of you may have heard of the Hone and Yar stages. So the Hone and Yar stages were developed in the late 60s uh, by Melvin Yar and one of uh, his residents. Uh, one, of, one of the things to remember about the stages of Parkinson's disease, the Hone and Yar stages, is that they were never designed to track individual patients over time. They're a research tool to help to group patients together that are similar with regard to where they are in their disease. So uh, with regard to do all patients go through all the stages, definitely not. Uh, someone can be a, a stage one Parkinson's disease patient uh, and then uh, be in a car accident tomorrow. Someone else might uh, never uh, might have other medical problems that never allow them to get past stage three. One patient who's a stage three uh, may, by testing, be a stage three, but actually do better and do better for longer than someone who's a stage two. So the take-home point with regard to this is that the stages uh, are not so important in the individual patient. Uh, the, the, the common cliche is if you've met one patient with Parkinson's, you've met one patient with Parkinson's. Everybody's different with regard to their disease symptoms, so we often don't like to have patients be too fixated on stages. Uh, maybe we'll... sure. All right, is everybody having fun? <laughs> um, uh, thank you for coming this morning. Um, it's really, actually, it's really our pleasure to do this. It's always fun to have you guys here and exciting to come on a morning like this. So um, we're all enjoying ourselves too. Um, I have a couple of uh, drug questions here. Someone asked about uh, gabapentin um, and long-term risks of use. So. Uh, first of all, what is gabapentin? Gabapentin is a medication that we as neurologists typically use to treat what's called neuropathic pain. These are the abnormal sensations you might get. Let's say if you have a pinched nerve and it causes tingling or burning sensation, and gabapentin is often used for that. Sometimes we use it for many other kind of uh, off, well, uh, conditions, things like anxiety, sometimes even off-label for tremor. So there are a lot of different uses for gabapentin. I, I can't possibly tell you all of the uses. Um, it's a really well-tolerated medication that's fairly benign. Um, it, it rarely re interacts with any other medications that you're taking. Um, long-term, I have not heard of, and I don't know if any of our, our group have heard of any long-term effects from it. It is not an addicting medication doesn't cause excessive toxicity either. You can take um, really low levels, 100 milligrams, and very high doses of gabapentin, um, over 5,000 milligrams of the medication for years, okay? Um, so really good medication. Um, there are some side effects. Obviously, it makes people sleepy. Um, sometimes it can cause swelling, particularly in the legs. Um, so. Uh, but generally, I just want to let you know it's a really well-tolerated medication and safe. Uh, the other drug is not really a FDA drug. It's actually CBD oil. Um, this is a really common 
um, question in our clinic these days. Uh, why don't you, have, real quick, how many people actually have, have, or just you can show a hand, know anyone who's tried CBD oil? Not necessarily yourself, but yeah, a lot of you. Okay. Um, so this is in the line of that medical marijuana question, but CBD oil is not medical marijuana. So for those of you who don't know, um, CBD oil is over the counter. You don't need a doctor's order to get it. Um, it's technically not legally sold in Florida yet. Um, the legislature is still working on that. Uh, despite that, um, no one's going after you. You can buy it over the counter at almost any place. Um, CBD oil is actually, for the most part, a hemp derivative, um, and it contains a low level of go cannabinoid or cannabis um, in it. So it's a low level. Um, it's not regulated by the FDA or any pharmacy. So um, honestly, I don't really know what concentrating, concentration you're getting in the bottle that you're getting or what you're getting at all. Um, but you know, the uses for CBD oil are similar to basically medical marijuana or the cannabis that you're using. It's just a lower concentration um, and uh, generally pretty well tolerated by most folks, um, but you should consider it as a drug. Um, its effects on Parkinson's disease are not well known, um, and generally uh, from medical marijuanas, we really don't know. There's great theory out there. There are what are called cannabinoid receptors in the part of the brain affected by Parkinson's disease. And so there is good theory that, you know, these drugs or, or well, cannabis might help Parkinson's, but um, unfortunately, because it's not federal or legal across the country, we have very limited studies about it. And as a whole, as neurologists and even us movement disorder specialists, we can't really are not able to really give you a good idea of whether this is good or even effective in Parkinson's disease. So our knowledge is really based on you and is largely anecdotal. And we do know that many patients do tell us that trying these medications, even CBD oil, which is lower concentration of cannabis, helps some symptoms. It's not, as far as we know, a treatment for the disease. Um, so it may be a symptomatic therapy for some of you that you can try. A couple of uses might be you know, anxiety, maybe helping you sleep in some cases if it works for you. Some folks have tried it for tremor. Um, some folks have tried it for their dyskinesias, their abnormal involuntary movements, and found uh, perhaps that it helps you. Um, in general, it's a relatively safe medication, um, and you can try it. Um, if you think it works for you, it's great. Um, but you should let us know if you're using it. These medications, um, particularly medical marijuana at higher doses, um, they do have potential side effects. Um, the other half of, the, of marijuana is a compound called THC that gives you that high um, and can cause confusion in some folks. So if that's part of your disease, um, be careful, okay? Plus, these are drugs, okay? These drugs can affect other medications. Um, so there can be interactions. So I encourage you to let us know. Don't be afraid to tell us. We're all kind of open about it. We want to know what you're taking, including something like CBD oil, um, and just tell us what you're doing with it. Um, let us know. Um, uh, I certainly am not against it. Um, and it can help uh, for certain patients. But I wish we had more information and could do more research on it. I think we need to have a lot more work left. Yeah, and just to add to that, right now it's uh, cannabinoids, medicines that have that in them, are still considered a Schedule Four, meaning they're very restricted who can do any research on it. So right now it's all sort of like maybe it helps and the dosing that's done by these doctors is totally not based on any sort of scientific evidence it's just a thought what if it helps and people are trying it so we don't know yet we also know that regular cannabis chronic use can raise apathy and psychosis risk which are already risks in parkinson's so everything with a you know has some caution involved too so we're looking forward to learning more about whether it helps or not uh, does Matt have a question? Matt doesn't. I don't. If yet. anybody has any nutrition or yeah. vitamin questions, we please feel free to ask them. Matt's up here. Um, I have a nutrition question for Matt. Right. Matt, can you can you um, can you tell the audience um, a little bit uh, about 
weight loss and um, Parkinson and what they can do to, to stay ahead of the curve? I'd be happy to. So anybody who came to my talk this morning might have already heard a little bit about this, but weight loss is somewhat common in patients with Parkinson's disease. As time goes on, we tend to see, or at least in my patients, there seems to be this chronic decrease in weight over months and years. And so I would really encourage everybody to monitor their weight, maybe not daily, but weekly. And then just to kind of be aware of where your weight is at, because you might not be changing anything. You know, your, uh, your needs as far as calories might go up due to different organ systems responding differently due to the disease progression. And so it's just something to keep in mind. One thing that you would need to partner with your physician and myself as the dietitian on is maybe meal scheduling as it relates to uh, your Parkinson's disease drugs, um, really making sure that you're not skipping meals. A lot of times I see patients who have a very light breakfast and a very light lunch and their dinner is the most significant meal of the day. You would really like to take those opportunities to kind of train your body to expect food at those times. If you eat, you know, a, a big breakfast over a couple weeks, your body will come uh, to expect that food. So that's a real simple way just to kind of get a little bit more food in day to day. We can also encourage um, and prioritize foods that are high calorie and high protein, like hummus, avocado. We can add mayonnaise to tuna, uh, other fatty fish to kind of just get more high quality calories in there during the day as well. If we have to, we can always go to uh, nutrition supplements. Dietitians are always food first, but we are going to utilize tools like Ensure and Boost and other things like that and smoothies to kind of increase caloric intake. It's a lot of nutrition in a very small amount. So you can get an extra 300 calories a day just by adding an Ensure to that. So there's a lot of different avenues we can take. So if you're having uh, issues with weight loss, please seek out uh, your physician and myself as the dietitian. Uh, we'd be happy to help you with that. I, Yes, I also have a question here. Can you uh, expand upon the B12 discussion, good, bad, or indifferent? So especially as we age, we become less and less able to kind of assimilate B12 into the diet because, or B12 from the diet into our bodies because we kind of lose some of the factors involved in that absorption. So I would recommend taking a multivitamin supplement to all of my patients uh, and all people in general. It really just covers the bases we really don't want you to be deficient because you're avoiding a certain food just because you don't like it or anything like that. It's just a nice baseline uh, to keep you from becoming deficient in anything. There's also a lot of enzymatic processes and metabolic pass pathways that require B vitamins and um, other things uh, that we need from the diet. So if you're not getting those as well, you need those. Um, the, uh, the enzymatic factor that actually takes carbidopa, levodopa, and turns it into dopamine in the body requires B6. And so a multivitamin is something that you should definitely uh, take in if, if you're not. Um, yeah. And we do have two full-time dietitians on staff now. So if you have questions about how can I eat and still have my PD medicines work, what should I do with the timing, what can I eat, nutritionally dense food, so food that doesn't take a lot of space in your belly but gives you calories, they can really help with that. So the next question has to do with is PD apathy, is it part of Parkinson's? Is it a side effect of medicine? Is it, does it mean depression? Do, do medicines for depression affect it? And does it have to do with progression or what is it? So apathy means a loss of motivation or interest or drive. So it's the saying that you might have heard, my get up and go, got up and went. So it's like just not having the desire to do things. Is, and sometimes there's a physical component that it's tiring to do things. But sometimes it's just, I'll do it tomorrow or I don't feel like it. And it can be an issue because it's hard to do your rehab therapies and stay socially and physically active like you need to, like it's good for Parkinson's if you have apathy. So the question is, um, about whether it's part of the disease, the answer is yes. So a lot of times we talk about dopamine and Parkinson's and most of our medicines supplement dopamine. But it's not just a dopamine problem. In fact, this, the neurotransmitters are brain chemicals, serotonin and norepinephrine, which is kind of like adrenaline. Those are affected too. So people can have less drive. And the circuits that go between the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, and the deep parts of the brain get involved. And this is why people can have apathy, even if they're not depressed. It doesn't mean you're depressed, although it's definitely a symptom of depression. People with Parkinson's get apathy even if they're not depressed. 
it really can occur at any point, early on, middle, later. It's more common if people have had it longer, but it really could be seen at any point. Do medicines make it worse? Well, medicines can make people fatigued and tired, and that can sort of contribute to not having desire to do things. Some antidepressants improve motivation and drive because they treat depression. Some of them can even have a side effect that contributes to apathy, so it's very tricky. It's kind of a working with your healthcare team to kind of find the best solution. The medicines that help people move better with Parkinson's don't necessarily help you have more motivation and drive. So a lot of times you have to do things like schedule your activity independent of your drive or desire. So the best example is exercise. If I tell myself I'm only going to exercise if I'm in the mood for it, then I may never get around to it. But if I tell myself three days a week, 30 minutes, I'm going to be exercising independent of whether I really feel like it that day, that's going to get the results. So I think that Lisa from our um, rehab team Lisa Warren is going to make some comments about apathy, too. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. You heard quite a bit this morning about how important exercise and activity is. And as Dr. Malati was saying, scheduling is of utmost importance. It's really hard to live by a schedule, but if you're dealing with apathy, uh, you really have to do that. You have to schedule your activities, and it needs to be at a certain time on a certain day. And that is just as important as your medication or your visit to the doctor. So the key to it is to take the decision making out of it. Because if you ask yourself, do I want to go for a walk or not? If you're apathetic, the answer is not. So you schedule it, there's a certain time, things happen Monday, Wednesday, Friday at nine o'clock or whatever fits into your schedule, that you really have to resort to that when you're apathetic. You know you need to do it, you know how important it is. It's not a lack of insight, it's not a cognitive issue, it's that lack of motivation. So scheduling activities at a very specific time and treating it as though it's a doctor's appointment or a medication will help to, to maintain some activity. And, and of course, you have good days and bad days and good moments and bad moments, but you can schedule and plan it in a way that's going to fit in with your medication schedule to give you the best chance of succeeding at it. So that's important. Do you want to take another one? Or do you want to take it? Um, I also uh, uh, want to recognize that in the um, audience, we have one of our uh, memory specialists from the uh, Fixel and uh, they see patients with memory disorders and, and Alzheimer's disease and Marie Kaur. Can you put your hand up? I knew, I, I didn't realize, I saw you there hiding. When I got up here, I saw a better vantage. She's hiding, but she's over there at table one. So if you all need any, any help there. Uh, the question is about um, Parkinson's disease and claustrophobia and what to do. Um, raise your hand if you have claustrophobia, a fear of so if you look at the population of um, people in the United States, you know, probably, you know, a few percent of them, just like a couple of, only a couple of hands went up, a few percent of people here have claustrophobia. So we don't commonly see claustrophobia with Parkinson, but we probably see it a little more commonly than you would normally see in the general population. So we do have that. We also see, remember, phobia means fear, you know, when you look at Greek and Latin and derivations, and so we see fear of going out into crowds, agoraphobia, and being around people. Sometimes we see that, and we can see a lot of anxiety and anxiety disorders, and sometimes those all kind of meld together. And when you get Parkinson, when the dopamine and the other chemicals are maybe not as available as they would be in the normal brain. It can make some of the problems that were there worse. And occasionally we'll see somebody without obsessive symptoms or anxiety or claustrophobia. It pops up as a new diagnosis with the Parkinson. That's very rare, but occasionally we do see it. It can be very difficult to treat. We use our um, interdisciplinary team of psychologists, psychiatrists, and we try medications uh, as well. The claustrophobia that impacts getting MRI scans, that's where we see it the most commonly. And you may not know you're claustrophobic until some crazy doctor writes a prescription for you to go to have an MR and you go inside, inside the MR scanner and it's very closed and it's very loud and all of a sudden you'll realize, 
I think I'm a little claustrophobic, and after five or ten minutes, you might be a lot claustrophobic. And so we, uh, we tend to use medications that are old-fashioned and sedating, sedating, so medicines like Valium and what we call benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valium, Clonazepam, this group of medicines. They're not the greatest because they can cause side effects, but they're very sedating, so they can put, put you to sleep a little bit so you can get your scans. And using these long-term in patients hasn't been that great for treating things like claustrophobia. So that's why we try to work with our interdisciplinary team to come up with, with um, ways to do that. Now, one last comment, um, since Dr. McFarland brought it up, I didn't bring it up, but the, the CBD oil comes up all the time. And I think a number of years ago, I wrote a chapter and I put the chapter about this in, and everybody, including maybe a few people up here with me, thought, okay, he's finally gone over the edge, you know, with marijuana and Parkinson, and where is this going? But Nick is right. There are cannabinoid receptors all over the brain, and once we learn a little more about how to target them and how to, how to efficiently get drugs to the brain that, that can help, they're much less sedating and much better tolerated than some of these Valium-like medications. So we have noticed people with panic disorders and severe anxiety disorders can do well on CBD oil or CBD with some THC, the more traditional marijuana formulations. And so anxiety and sleep and pain, anxiety, sleep, and pain seem to be three things that are popping up in our patients that may improve with either CBD or traditional medical marijuana. So for claustrophobia, I don't know if anybody's tried it up here. I haven't tried it before, but if you had chronic claustrophobia, that may be a less sedating option. Um, we don't have any data on it, but that might be something to think about. Um, last thing here is, how is our um, assistant Alexandra doing down here? I mean, is she doing well? <laughs> So um, if anybody needs any food, any more food or any help or anything, just put your hand up and Alexandra will come to you. She's full concierge, well, well trained, two really good parents. So, Chris. Okay. So, Provigil is it still so much money? I stopped when the copay was over a thousand dollars a month several years ago. Uh, so most patients who are on ProVigil, it varies depending on the type of insurance you have, but most of them do experience a significant cost. There's another medication called New Vigil that I was just looking up on my phone that seems to be uh, a little bit lower with regard to the cost per month. The $1,000 looks like it's about the same uh, compared to what it had been when this uh, questioner was asking about it. So uh, there are all other alternatives if it's not financially feasible, and there are often for different types of medications, not just ProVigil, but uh, payment programs that you can get through the, potentially qualify for through the manufacturer, so that's something always to uh, consider as well. Uh, there's a question. The Aware and Care Kit is a, a wonderful resource, but hospitalization is extremely stressful for both patients and caregivers alike. Can we ever hope for better synergy in hospital care for PD patients? Uh, my answer to this is yes, we can hope. I think if we expect, uh, that may be a little bit more of a stretch. So uh, hospital care and hospitalization is not designed for the Parkinson's care patient. Nursing staffing is not designed for the frequency of medication required to give to patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, we have published a number of uh, studies at the University of Florida showing uh, that patients, as Dr. Oaken mentioned this morning, do not do well in the hospital. In most cases, when people are hospitalized, there's an increased risk of infections and hallucinations. So staying out of the hospital is always a, a challenge and a good thing to do if you can for someone who's, who's older. But uh, it continues to be a significant challenge for people uh, with Parkinson's disease that I think it's going to be very challenging to try to address that. Uh, there was a question, are there known drugs that exacerbate Parkinson's? Uh, yes, there are. So metoclopramide or Reglan, which is sometimes given for chronic nausea, is known to worsen Parkinsonism. A lot of the antipsychotic medications that are sometimes given for hallucinations can work in worsen Parkinson's. So Abilify or Geodon or Zyprexa or Haldol, any of those medications are not the type of medications that most patients with Parkinson's need to be on. Uh, in that class, typically Seroquel, 
or quetiapine is the only medication that does not tend to worsen Parkinson's disease symptoms. And one last question for me. Have there been studies on inflammation and food sensitivities related to Parkinson's disease? So there are um, the what's called gut-brain axis, or the interaction between uh, gut bacteria, the enteric nervous system, which is a nervous system that, that innervates the viscera, and Parkinson's disease in the brain in general is a very active area of research. There are some reasons to think that patients with Parkinson's disease, based on some of the studies that are out there, have inflammation uh, in the gut uh, that may be related to and may be actually worsened by slow transit. So as food th moves through your gut, there is a breakdown, a process of breakdown that's typically doesn't include certain chemicals. And the longer the stool sits in the gut, the more abnormal that chemical breakdown can be. So there are patients who have both a combination of decreased uh, intestinal transit and what's called a leaky gut syndrome or inflammation in the gut, and that can actually give rise to periods of, of hallucination and confusion. All right. So um, I think someone wrote this question just for me. Uh, what's the difference between Parkinson's and Parkinson's-like syndromes? Um, this, this is a, a bit of a long discussion, but I'll, I'll try to make it short here, really. I think the question kind of relates to um, what we see as what's called Parkinsonism, and I think that a lot of patients ask me why I got diagnosed with Parkinsonism and not Parkinson's disease and why. And I think the issue there really is what we're faced with as physicians really is that we see you come into our clinic with a certain set of symptoms. And sometimes we're not able to take all those symptoms and you know, come up with a cause or a specific diagnosis, and sometimes we give out a, a, a descriptive term. Parkinsonism actually is a constellation of symptoms, okay? Not necessarily a, a diagnosis. Those symptoms are really things like the typical rest tremor that you see in Parkinson's disease, the rigidity or stiffness, slowed movement or no movement, um, and then what's called postural instability, that thing that, that reflex that you have keeps you from falling when you get off balance, okay? These are all symptoms that are specific for Parkinsonism. They're not all specific for Parkinson's disease, and you know, we have basic criteria where we need to diagnose both what's called Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. Um, so the most common cause of Parkinsonism or Parkinson's-like symptoms is Parkinson's disease by far, okay? But as physicians here, we all know there's kind of not a secret really is that there are many things out there that can mimic the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and give you what's called Parkinsonism. Um, you know, there's a whole host of things, um, just basically disorders like uh, stroke, uh, we call vascular disease in the brain, um, toxins that we know about in the environment that cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. Toxins also include drugs, just the drugs we give you. We, I think Dr. Hess just mentioned a few drugs that can either mimic those symptoms, um, drugs that can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms, uh, particularly if you're treated for a mood disorder and they give you what's called an antipsychotic um, type medication, such as like Abilify, that's just to name one of many, many, many drugs that are out there. But this is as long as our, not just our arm, but our leg, essentially, of things that can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. There are other things that can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms, like water on the brain, or we call hydrocephalus. There is a disorder that's um, that you may see commercials about or even hear about called normal pressure hydro hydrocephalus or abbreviated NPH. It has many symptoms that mimic Parkinson's or Parkinson's disease, so we give it, call it Parkinsonism. But there are certain features that are different, um, and those are things that you should ask us about. Um, on the other side, really, there are different um, both genetic disorders that we know about, and there's a very long list of genetic disorders that can that are not Parkinson's disease, but um, you know, they may cause familial Parkinson-like symptoms, um, and we have to differentiate those two. And then what I do in many times in my clinics, I also look at a set of disorders we call that are atypical Parkinson disorders that look very much like Parkinson's disease, but they have some features that are different. So um, what we do really as physicians really is we, you know, every year, you know, every time we see a patient, especially a new patient, then annually, we review kind of what we see. And, and we're looking for signs and symptoms um, that are red flags. For instance, um, is your Parkinson's symptoms progressing more rapidly than we would expect, okay? Um, 
is your tremor not the typical kind of tremor that we would expect, or you don't have a tremor? Um, now, that doesn't mean you don't have Parkinson's disease, but it is a sign or symptom that sometimes we need to look at and assess. Are you, is this not really what we typically are thinking about as Parkinson's disease? Um, are you having more severe gait problems? Are you falling frequently within that first five years of disease, which is not as typical for most Parkinson's patients? Um, what is your response to medication, for instance? Um, levodopa is, you know, it's been around for decades now. It is the gold standard medication for Parkinson's disease. And for the vast majority of Parkinson's disease patients, you get benefit from levodopa. And that benefit is pretty marked, and we can actually document it. But there is a small percentage of patients who have Parkinson's disease who don't really get excellent benefit. And there are some features that sometimes are more refractory, um, gait, some forms of tremor in Parkinson's disease. But that is one of our red flag signs that makes us start to pause and start to think about, is this really Parkinson's disease? So um, the bottom line really is, I want to say, there are many things that can give you what are called Parkinson's-like things. Um, if you don't think that you have Parkinson's disease and you're concerned, you should ask us um, and you know, make us start to think about it. Um, we'll do that automatically for you. That's our job. Um, and uh, what I would say is that it's important to help, you know, to distinguish Parkinson's disease from these other disorders. Um, in some cases, you know, if it's a medication that's causing your symptoms, we can stop the, or, or determine which, what's the offending medication. If it's fluid on the brain, like hydrocephalus, we can treat that. We can put a shunt in um, in some patients, and you have a remar remarkable improvement in some patients, okay? Um, if it's an atypical Parkinson's disorder, that's something you want to know because it may progress differently. You may want to plan differently, and there may be other medications or other treatments that may be beneficial for you um, in your disease, okay? Um, so a lot of different. This is a really great question. Uh, it's a long answer, um, but I'll, I'll leave it at there, and if you have any other uh, questions about it, please come see me, okay? So we've gone over our time. We always enjoy getting your questions. If you had one that didn't get answered or you have one in your mind that comes to you now, Grab one of us afterwards. We want to thank all of you for coming. We want to thank the person who sent up, please don't ever leave UF. We appreciate that comment. And, and we want to thank all the volunteers. Would you stand up for one second? All the volunteers that helped.